electron configurations. We've been talking about these different orbitals that the electrons can be in. And so now we're going to learn how to describe what orbitals the electrons are, are in. That sentence just kind of died, didn't it? Um, <coughs> electron configuration describes which orbitals have electrons in them and how many, orbit how many electrons are in the orbital. So if we look at hydrogen, um, hydrogen has one electron and it's normally going to hang out in the 1s orbital and so we use a superscript to tell us how many electrons are in that orbital. This is one of the few instances where chemists do write the number 1. Schrodinger's equation allows us to calculate um, uh, buh, 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 buh. let me read that a minute. Calculations with Schrodinger's equation show that hydrogen's one electron occupies the lowest energy orbital in the atom. And so, you know, everything's easier for hydrogen because there's just the one electron. When, when you get to multi-electron atoms, there is interaction between the electrons, and so you can't solve Schrodinger's equation exactly. And so they have to do approximations because we have to throw in additional terms because of the interactions. And so we get approximate solutions. And the orbitals are hydrogen-like. Okay, so the S orbital is spherical, and the P and the D, they have those shapes. But we can't, we can't um, calculate them exactly. And then there's two more ideas that affect these multi-electron atoms. One is electron spin and the other is energy splitting of sublevels. Remember we talked about the spin quantum number, m sub s. It can be either plus one half or minus one half. All electrons have spin. They're going to be either plus or minus. Um, and so when we write an orbital diagram, we, we just have decided that an arrow pointing up is going to be the electron with a positive spin and down is going to be negative spin. So an orbital diagram, we're going to use a box to represent an orbital, and we're going to have arrows represent the electrons. I like these because they're more of a picture, and I'm a visual person. I want to see where are those electrons. If you look at a group of hydrogen atoms, each of them has one electron. Roughly half of them will be spin up, and the other half will be spin down. It's kind of like male and female. You know, you look at the general population roughly, Half are women, half are men. The Pauli exclusion, exclusion principle tells us that no two electrons in an atom can have the same four quantum numbers. So each electron has a unique set of quantum numbers, a little bit like a social security number or something. If you have two electrons in the same orbital, then they're going to have three identical quantum numbers, the principle, the angular momentum, and the, I'm blanking, help me out here, m sub l, I'm blanking, anyway, there's n, l, and m sub l, can't remember what they are. If these are the same, the fourth quantum number has to be different. So each orbital can have only two electrons and they have to have opposite spins. So if we know the number of orbitals in a sublevel, we can figure out the maximum number of electrons that can be in there. The S sublevel has one orbital, so it can have two electrons. The P sublevel has three orbitals, we get six. D has five, total of 10 electrons. F has seven, total of 14 electrons. If we look at helium, helium has two electrons they are going to be in the lowest orbital, lowest energy orbital. That's the 1s. We put a 2 here to indicate there's two electrons in there. The orbital diagram would be a box to represent the 1s orbital with one spin up and one spin down. If we compare the quantum numbers here, they both have n equals 1, l equals 0, m sub l equals 0. One of them is plus 1 half, one of them is minus 1 half. Um, 
For hydrogen, because there's only one electron, the sublevels in each principal energy level all have the same energy. The orbital energy depends only on that principal quantum number. And so we call orbitals with the same energy degenerate, in the same energy level. But in multi-electron atoms, these sublevels split. They're not degenerate. There's charge interactions, there's shielding of the outer electrons from the nucleus by the inner electrons, there's penetration, there's all kinds of factors. But generally, the lower the value of L within a principal level, the lower the energy of the orbital. So if you're talking about, say, N equals 4, S will be lower than P, lower than D, and F will have the highest energy. That will hold true in a given principal energy level. Gotta be, I need a picture. Where's the picture? Come on. There. We gotta look at this picture. Then we'll get back to that other stuff. So here in green, we have the, the second energy level, and we see that P is higher than two than S. P is higher than two. And aliens wear purple hats. In the third level, S P D. But there's overlap between the two levels. Okay, so the 4s is actually lower than the 3d. So that's, that makes things more complicated. It's because of the interaction between the electrons. Coulomb's law describes the potential energy of two charged particles. And since electrons are charged particles, they have to obey Coulomb's law. So the energy is equal to 1 over um, this is a constant, times the charge on each of the objects divided by R. So for like charges, E is positive. If Q1 and Q2 are both positive, E is positive. If these are both negative, E is positive. They're going to repel each other. If one is positive, one is negative, then E will be negative and they're going to attract each other. This potential energy increases as the particles get closer together. As R becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, E gets larger. And so the strength of the interaction increases as you get closer together. The strength also increases as the size of the charges increase. If these are plus 2 and minus 2, you're going to have a stronger interaction than if they're plus 1, minus 1. Shielding is the idea that each electron experiences both the attraction of the nucleus and repulsion from the other electrons in the atom. Because the electrons all have negative charges. They don't like each other. They're trying to get away. And the repulsions cause the electron to have a net reduced attraction to the nucleus. It's shielded, in other words. Um, this is how I think of it. Let's pick something relatively small. Let's think of maybe, maybe lithium. And let's just look at a Bohr model of lithium. So there's the nucleus and two energy levels. And let's let these guys be the electrons. And so there's going to be two electrons in the first energy level, and there's going to be one in the second energy level. In this nucleus, there are three protons, three positive charges. But these two in the middle kind of cancel out two of those three positive charges. And so this guy is only seeing a plus one charge, whereas these guys are seeing plus three charges. Does that make sense? These electrons that are closer to the nucleus are shielding the outer electron from the charge of the nucleus. There's attraction between the negative electrons and the positive nucleus. Does that make sense to anybody? OK, good. So we talk about an effective nuclear charge. That's the attraction that an electron feels for the nucleus. And it basically ends up being the um, charge on the nucleus minus the charge of the inner, the number of the inner electrons. There's also an idea of penetration, that the closer the electron is to the nucleus, the more attraction it experiences. And some types of orbitals are, are better at penetrating 
than others. So if we have an, an outer electron, one in one of the higher energy levels, if it's better at penetrating the electron cloud of the inner electrons, it's going to have more attraction for the nucleus. So the degree of penetration is related to the orbital's radial distribution function. If it's got a really big node in the center, it's not going to have very much penetration and it's not going to have as much attraction to the nucleus as, say, like an S orbital that has better penetration. Oh, here's the shielding picture. So here we have hmm, lithium. I wonder how I picked that. Three plus charge in the nucleus. We have two electrons that are closer in the one, n equals one level, and then we have this guy on the outside. He experiences a net charge of about minus one. I'm sorry, plus one. Plus one. Because these two guys essentially cancel out two of the charges here. But if he penetrates, if he's able to get inside this cloud, now he's going to experience the full charge because these guys aren't getting between him and the nucleus. You can't get just between an electron. Well, actually, maybe you could. They're unpredictable, aren't they? If we look at the spatial distributions of these different orbitals, um, here's the 1s <laughs> in the purple here, and the 2p and the 2s, we see that the s orbitals have more penetration than the p orbital does. Sorry, this is the p orbital. The p orbitals are more shielded. The 2s is, is lower in energy than the 2p because it, it penetrates more deeply. So because of this, we've got s and p orbitals not being degenerate. They're not at the same level. The p is going to be higher. And at the fourth and the fifth, it becomes really important. And so then the, even the levels start to overlap. The separations um, get smaller and smaller as you go out. And then the relative energy ordering gets all crazy. That's my summary of that. But this is a very helpful table to look at when you're trying to do orbital diagrams or electron configurations because the order of filling is 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, 3d, 4p, 5s, 4d. Just climbing up the ladder. Okay, so I'm going to give you this analogy. I, I told it to my 3a students. My husband thinks it's insane and stupid, but he's not here, is he? Huh? Yeah. Well, I, I told him about that video I showed you guys on Tuesday. And he, was, he thought it was a great idea, but he hasn't bothered to look at it yet. The one with the, the box, the guy with the box. Anyway, so this is my um, analogy, my attempt to help students understand. Oops, didn't draw that very well. My attempt to help students understand this whole idea of the, the order of all these orbitals. Have you ever been to Las Vegas or driven through Las Vegas? Well, if you haven't, in my mind, you're not missing much. But they have some really outrageous architecture, right? So, like, there's this, um, there's this casino that's built like this gold pyramid, and it's just, like, shiny. It's like this giant gold pyramid, and they've got other things that are just, they're just crazy. So this is, this is the sort of a hotel that maybe you would see in Vegas or something. This is like an inverted half pyramid or something. So it wouldn't be good in California with earthquakes because it's a little top heavy. It wouldn't be real steady. But anyway, this is the hotel. And each of these principal energy levels is a floor in the hotel. And if you want to stay on the higher floors, it costs more money. So money is like energy. Okay? The, the, the principal quantum numbers are the floor numbers. And each of these subshells, like this P subshell, that's one room in the hotel. So on the first floor of this hotel, there's one room. On the second floor, there's two rooms, the S room and the P room. The third floor has three rooms, S, P, and D. The fourth has four, S, P, D, and it's not shown here, but F. Okay. And then the individual orbitals are the beds in the hotel rooms. 
So S rooms all have one double bed, and the P rooms have three double beds, and the D rooms have five double beds. The electrons are like the people that go to stay in the hotel. And they're cheap, like most people are, and they're not going to pay out for a more expensive room when a cheaper one's available. So, you know, you've got a bunch of electrons coming to a convention or something, and the first one's going to take this room, and the second one's going to take that room. And then the fire marshal says, that one's full. You'll have to go to the next one because we can only have two in a room. Well, only two in, per bed. And so then they have to go to this one, and that costs more. This one is further down from the elevator and the ice machine, and so that costs a little bit more because it's quieter than this one. You never want to be right next to the ice machine, right? And then the third one, again, as you go down the hall, the prices get higher. And then the whole idea of the electrons um, spin is that this is like the head of the electron. And these people are going to sleep head to toe in the beds. Because this is not a romantic event, OK? There's nobody interested in each other. And so they're just, they're just shacking up, but be out of necessity. So they're going to sleep head to toe. They actually used to do this um, back in the, I think it was the 1800s. I went to Fort Snelling in Minnesota once. They got these bunks, and they're, they're actually very narrow, twin sort of sized bunks. And the soldiers would sleep there, two to a bed. So two on the bottom, two on the top. And they would sleep head to toe like this, because they fit in the beds better that way. And then I guess they didn't have to worry about, I don't know, anything. Anyway, so that's my, that's my hotel. So I'll, I'll probably refer to that a little bit. So when we talk about orbital filling, the electrons are going to occupy the orbitals to minimize the energy of the atom. The people, the electron people in that hotel are going to pay as little as possible to stay there. They're going to go in the lowest price rooms. The electrons go in the lowest energy orbitals. So the lower energy orbitals fill before the higher energy orbitals. Um, the Aufbau principle um, is, is just that, that they fill the lower energy ones first. Orbitals in the same sublevel have the same energy. So like if we go back to this, these three P orbitals are in the same sublevel. They have the same energy. The three beds in the same room cost the same. You can't charge someone more for one of the beds when all the beds are the same and they're in the same room. So each of these is the same in energy. All the, all the orbitals in the D, 3D subshell are degenerate. They're equal in energy. This is the filling order. You can memorize that, but I will be showing you how you can get that from the periodic table. It's actually all hiding in the periodic table. It's amazing. Another idea is the orbitals can hold no more than two electrons each. That's the Pauli exclusion principle. And the spins are opposite. So it's like the fire, fire marshal saying, no, you can only have two people in a bed. Nobody can sleep on the floor. They all have to sleep in the beds. Now, I, I remember being in grad school and going to a conference, and you know the, the advisor would pay for a room. And so there's four girls in a room with two beds, right? And, you sleep in the same bed with each other. And there's four guys in a hotel room with two beds. Two of the guys sleep on the floor, <laughs> right? That's how it is, right? So here, they do not allow you to sleep on the floor. So to avoid any appearances, these guys sleep head to toe, OK? Opposite spins. Then there's Hun's rule. Hun's rule says that when you're filling degenerate orbitals, the electrons will fill them singly first with parallel spins. So say we're going into that 3D hotel room. There's five beds. We've got three people. Are two of them going to sleep together in one bed? No, they're each going to take their own bed if they can. Once all the beds have one person in them, the next guy coming in is going to have to double up with somebody. It's a little bit like riding a, a bus, public transportation. You guys have any experience with that? 
I used to ride the bus when I was in college. So you, you get on the bus, and it's like you don't know anybody, right? And, and most of the people don't know anybody either. And so there's all these seats with one person in them, and then there's an empty seat next to them. You don't go sit next to a stranger if there's a completely empty seat where you could sit by yourself, right? You go sit by yourself. Once all the seats are half full, then anybody getting on, nobody thinks twice about them sitting by a stranger. Because of course you're going to sit if you can, right? So that's what Hun's rule is. It's uh, choosing a seat on the bus. So this is one way to remember the order of filling. You draw this out like this. Um, here are all the S's, the P's, the D's, the F's. And then you start up here and you go like this. That's first, second, third, fourth, etc. That works really great for some people. If that works for you, you'll figure it out. I'm going to show you a different way later. So just some notes about electron configurations. Um, unless the question says otherwise, we assume that the electron configuration is the ground state, the lowest energy state. Sometimes they'll say, draw, you know, is this an excited state? But most of the time we're talking about the ground state. The number of electrons in a neutral atom equals its atomic number. So, you know, we look at lithium on the periodic table, it's atomic number three. That means it has three protons and three electrons for a neutral atom. If we have ions, then the electrons are going to be different based on the charge. One of the reasons that we get parallel, I'm sorry, electrons with parallel, oh, electrons with parallel spins have correlated motion that minimizes their mutual repulsion. We'll just leave that at that. Um, each orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons. Enough with that. So I think of the electron configuration as the guy at the front desk of the hotel. This is his little shorthand because he has to keep track of how many people are staying in each room so that if someone else comes in, he can tell them which room to go to, right? So for Krypton, Krypton has 36 electrons. And so this is what the front desk clerk is going to write down for that day when there's 36 people. 1s2, so there's two electrons in the 1s orbital. 2s2 means two electrons in the 2s orbital. 2p6, there's the 2p orbital, I'm sorry, subshell has three orbitals. That's full with six electrons. 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10. The 3d subshell, the 3d room, has five beds. It can hold 10 people. And then there's 4 at 4p6. It's just a shorthand. Um, we can make the shorthand even shorter. Um, we can take the inner electron configuration, or I prefer to call it the noble gas configuration, and use the symbol of that noble gas to represent all of the inner electrons. So if we look at rubidium, on the periodic table, rubidium is element number 37, right? It's one past krypton. Right? Krypton has 36. We just did all of this for Krypton. Rubidium has 37. The first part of this is all the same. This, all the same. So instead of writing all of that out, we just write the symbol for Krypton in brackets. The same as Krypton, plus it's got one electron in the 5s orbital. Saves a lot of writing. So here's some examples of electron configurations. So lithium has three electrons. So the orbital diagram, I think, is really helpful because here's the 1s and the 2s. And we see down here, here's the 3p. And these little boxes are like the beds in the room. And then you just fill them in. Change colors here. So for three electrons, the first guy goes in like that, and the second guy goes in like that, because that room's cheaper. The third guy says, oh, i got to pay more. And I'll go up to the next room. And so then the electron configuration, we look at what's over here. Well, there's two in here, so that's 1s2, 2s1. There's the electron configuration. Beryllium has four electrons. 
So they, they always follow the same order. First they're going to fill that one, and then this guy, and then this guy. 1s2, 2s2. Let's jump down to carbon. Carbon's got six electrons. This one in there, that one in there, that one's full. The next guy has to pay more. He's going to bunk up with that guy, and then they have to pay more. This room has three beds. The second guy is going to take his own bed. Okay? He's not going to share if he doesn't have to. And the next element after carbon is nitrogen. The next electron coming in for nitrogen would go here. He's going to take his own. Then, after nitrogen, it's oxygen, right? Oxygen would start filling up here. And then fluorine. And then neon. It's not showing? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I was doing it at the bottom. You fooled me. That's good. I like that. So, so that's the idea of filling. Now, this would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, right? 1s2, because there's two electrons in that subshell, 2s2, 2p6. And that is a total of 10 electrons, which corresponds to neon. So that would be for neon. Any questions? Once you get the hang of this, it's really not bad. Thinking about the shapes of the orbitals, well, that can be bad. But the electron configurations, that seems pretty easy in comparison. So let's write the electron configurations for chlorine, silicon, strontium, and oxygen. OK, chlorine. How many electrons does it have? 17. OK, so for this one, I'm going to do the, the boxes first, orbital diagram. So there's going to be 1s and 2s and 2p and 3s. and 3p. The first level, n equals 1, only has an s subshell. The second level, n equals 2, has s and p. And the third subshell has s, p, and d, but we're not going to need d. So now we're going to count and put in 17 electrons. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. That's an orbital diagram, which is really great for some things, but it involves drawing pictures and so it's hard to type. So electron configurations are better for typing something out. For an electron configuration, we're just going to look at this and say how many electrons are in each of these? Well, there's 1s and that has two electrons. 2s has two electrons. The 2p has six. The 3s has two. And the 3p has how many? Five. Right? It's this guy, all these together. What if we did a noble gas shorthand for chlorine? No, never mind. Let's not do that. We, we, we've got better stuff coming up. You feel like you have a handle on this? Yeah? Mm. No? Oh, it's 3s to 3p. 